In 2018, researchers in northern Madagascar discovered a creature that wasn't seen for over a hundred years. Yes, you heard that right, not seen by humans for a full century. Voltsko's chameleon is not the only creature that disappeared from human sight for lengthy periods. There's also the Wandiwoi tree kangaroo, which vanished for 90 years, and the Fernandina Galapagos tortoise, which was lost for 113 years, and many more are missing. Research suggests that 2,200 species in over 160 countries have not been seen in at least 10 years. That's pretty nuts, you might say, but as crazy as that is, what if I told you that not only are we missing thousands of species that we already discovered, but that we don't even know 80% of what's out there in the first place. What? In 2021, experts published a study reiterating that in a best case scenario, we know maybe 20% of the entire species on Earth, and that's being generous. Some estimates are as low as 1.5%. Most of the unknown species are plants, fungi, and invertebrates, like insects. In the oceans, researchers estimate that we're missing at least one third of species. We've got a lot of work to do to find these critters. However, some experts say that at our current effort level of exploring undescribed species, that process could take 300 years. Time is not on our side. I'm Mike DiGirolamo, and this is Problem Solved from Mangabe. Scientists warn that a human-induced wave of extinction, referred to as the sixth mass extinction, is causing species to go extinct 1,000 times or more above the natural extinction rate. We could see 500 land animals go extinct in the next 20 years. In comparison, the same number was lost over the whole of the last century alone. Now, describing and discovering the entirety of all this biodiversity is an enormous challenge in and of itself, and something that undoubtedly should be tackled. However, what we really need is conservation action. That action, however, is dependent on our ability to monitor land-based species, alert the world to their presence, and then do something about it. If we want to protect what we currently know exists now, we need to be able to monitor it more efficiently in real time. Conservation technology or species monitoring tech won't solve the six mass extinction crisis alone, but it could help us better protect a wide variety of land animals, and the downstream effect of this could contribute to protecting the larger array of biodiversity that exists today. So, what are some of the most promising ways of monitoring and keeping track of these critters, and why does this matter? Most of the species that exist today, roughly some six million of them, have not yet been discovered. Plants, animals, fungi, invertebrates like mollusks and crustaceans, and insects. In fact, insects likely make up the majority of missing species. In the ocean, researchers estimate that we're missing at least one third of species. Every trip to the deep ocean can yield new species. So it's the whole nine yards, just hiding out in the wild, sometimes in plain sight. Without a clear idea of our planet's biodiversity, its protection is a real challenge for scientists and institutions. But how does it affect the rest of us? Well, for one thing, research indicates that large swaths of biodiversity may protect humans from emerging infectious diseases through a variety of factors. Biodiversity helps create what's called the dilution effect, reducing the likelihood of disease transmission to humans. We could really use that. Also, eating is rather important, wouldn't you agree? Well, roughly a third of all crops grown globally are pretty much dependent on pollinators like bees. Also, more than half the plant species in existence rely on mammals and birds to disperse their seeds. If we lose this biodiversity, that would be pretty terrible for all of us, so protecting it has a direct effect on both your well-being and your daily living habits. Check out this map of life created by researchers in 2021 that reveals the regions with the highest concentration of undiscovered terrestrial species, which are in countries like Brazil, Colombia, Madagascar, or Indonesia. These places also tend to be biodiversity hotspots or places where there's an incredible amount of different kinds of plants and animals, and therefore lots of knowledge to gain about them. Estimates suggest that anywhere between 15 and 59% of current extinctions are from undescribed species. And if we don't know what these species are in the first place, we don't know the consequences of losing them. 
It's an important question and one we are trying to hastily answer. But if we want to discover all of this biodiversity, we need to be able to protect it first. Monitoring terrestrial land species like amphibians, reptiles, birds, and mammals serve as an indicator of the health of these biodiversity hotspots. This can create an impetus for conservation action in the form of protected areas. These serve as an umbrella to protect other species and the lands they live in, and by extension, all of that unknown biodiversity, protecting it from deforestation and other extractive human activities. These areas also store carbon and give resident species a refuge in the face of worsening climate change. To carry out all this monitoring, we rely on a variety of conservation tech, such as remote sensing, drones, camera traps, and mobile apps. Currently, these are the most widely used ways of helping us keep track of all of this biodiversity. But it's an incredibly difficult task. Why, you ask? Well, for one thing, many of them are in isolated ranges that are expensive to travel to, which tend to be in these remote tropical regions. It's not just hard to get to these places, but extremely difficult to work in them as they are often regions that have extreme and challenging weather and extreme and challenging topography. Literally, the landscape itself is a barrier to monitoring and discovery. Anyone up for a hike? Ultimately, experts say the biggest problem comes down to a lack of research funding and not enough experts to carry out this vital work. While existing conservation tech and biodiversity mapping tools help make the task a lot safer, cheaper, and more efficient, there are still limitations, like sorting through millions of photographs taken by camera traps, for example. One person doing this could take years. Fortunately for us, there are three promising pieces of emerging conservation tech that would go a long way towards improving our ability to discover and monitor the treasure trove of species we have. Let's start with a pretty fresh piece of tech that innovates the actual identification of species itself, environmental DNA. So what is eDNA? You might be familiar with DNA, usually represented as a little double helix chain in textbooks or movies. It's you, or at least the blueprint of you. It's your genetic roadmap. It's in your skin, hair, and pretty much every part of your body, and it can be used to identify you. So think of eDNA as kind of like traces of an animal's DNA that show up in soil or in water. This could be tiny amounts of fur, skin, and yes, droppings. Being able to analyze this data is what eDNA is all about. It doesn't just help us monitor species we can see, but it can also help us detect species that are too difficult to track using other methods. eDNA can save a ton of time and money. Imagine being able to track the presence of shy land mammals simply by testing the water from a nearby river. Well, that's what Arno Liet did last year when his team analyzed the eDNA from the water of the lower catchment of the South Chilcotin Mountains in British Columbia. Welcome to British Columbia. I just saw a huge bear poop 100 meters from here, and I'm just collecting sample of water in the stream that you can see here, and screaming regularly, hey bear, so that they are aware that I'm here and we don't surprise each other. They found this method could track the biodiversity of land mammals as effectively as camera traps. Wait. Tracking land mammal biodiversity from water? Yes, we're not kidding. How? Well, I know this might sound gross, but bits of mammals end up in the water like, again, their droppings or skin. That can be analyzed. Its potential doesn't stop there. Scientists have used eDNA in water and soil samples to detect everything from bacteria, fungi, and invertebrates to fish, birds, and reptiles. Now, there are limitations to this technology. It cannot tell us the abundance of animals in a given location from a single sample, just whether or not they are present. However, scientists are pioneering a way to detect Sumatran rhino numbers by looking for specific DNA markers of individuals in, wait for it, their droppings. But perhaps a more notable real-world application of this tech would be the eBioAtlas program, a project that uploads eDNA from remote regions into an international database that monitors the status of the world's species. This data can be used to update the IUCN Red List, which is the foremost recognized authority on the status of the world's species. Updating that list can give local communities the ability to tell extractive industries, such as mining, hey, you can't mine here because there are endangered species present. Now, kupitia hii, tunamini kwamba samples zinazo kusagla, 
nita tusaidia katika kupata katika kupata taarifa mbalimbali za nini kilichopo katika water body yetu ya Mto Malagarasi ambayo mwisho wa siku tatupelekea pengine kuwa na sila bora katika kufanya management Super cool? I agree. eDNA isn't the end of the story though. You also need to be able to organize conservation data from all the other pieces of tech, ideally as you collect it. Doing that manually, well, let's just say is not fun. What you really need is a constantly updating one-stop shop that can be accessed online. Is that possible? Well, yes, it totally is. And it's possible with networked sensors. Data that comes from camera traps, such as the ones in treetops or on mountainsides, or acoustic sensors that pick up bird sounds in tropical regions, are super important, yes, especially for tracking populations of species. But being able to track that data in real time and link it on the internet for conservationists to see immediately is what networked sensors do. However, like a lot of the technology used in conservation, it remains inaccessible and unaffordable for most local or indigenous communities, which as I hope you now know, stand to contribute the most by being able to access and use these tools. That's where conservation tech companies come in. They make low-cost functional hardware that allow conservationists to upload and share data in areas without cell reception or Wi-Fi access. I think I'm detecting a trend here. But all this data isn't really any good if there's so much of it that experts can't rapidly analyze it to implement conservation action. We are, after all, in the sixth mass extinction, so we haven't got all day. That's why this last piece of tech is arguably as important as the data itself. AI machine learning. Artificial intelligence, which involves machine learning and computer vision, can sort through massive amounts of data to analyze and extrapolate trends quickly. Instead of hundreds of people having to look through millions of photos, eDNA samples, satellite images, or other data, machine learning can do this for you in minutes. Affordably, I might add. You think finding whales in the ocean is difficult? Well, what about identifying their songs from 190,000 hours of recorded audio? Doing that manually would take quite a while, so scientists at the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Institute are using AI to aid in the process. It helps establish patterns and sounds for species like humpbacks near the Hawaiian and Mariana Islands, and scientists can enjoy a little more free time. So with all these cool gadgets, what's keeping us from making some headway in tracking species and implementing some conservation solutions? Well, part of the problem is that our most critical stakeholders in conservation tech are local and indigenous communities who are disproportionately left out of the conversation when it comes to engaging and using all of this technology. You really need to get these tools into the hands of the people who monitor and protect these areas the most. And it's been proven time and again that local and indigenous peoples do exactly that. There is progress here with mobile apps that make this collaborative process easier and more accessible, especially to indigenous communities. But still more needs to be done. Developers should be working with conservationists and see the conditions in which they operate to ultimately make better products. However, many conservationists remain optimistic about the future of conservation tech, which is becoming increasingly accessible, collaborative, and continues to evolve rapidly. So there you have it. If this trend continues, humanity will be well on its way to discovering and better monitoring the currently countless species out there. Of course, then we need to use that data to take action to save these special species and places, which you can do by supporting and participating in conservation initiatives. You can even volunteer for citizen science programs in your area. Contact your nearest university, local government, or conservation organization to see if one exists around you. Yes you too can help monitor the existence of species. A rare instance where staying glued to your phone might be good for the environment. And you can also become active in the policy-making process around conservation in your area by making your voice heard and supporting local laws and policy that prioritize local stewardship of the land as well as indigenous rights. While species monitoring is only one piece of the puzzle, it's undoubtedly needed to help us ensure that we don't lose what we already have. 
If you enjoyed Problem Solved, please share this video and subscribe to Mongabay on YouTube by clicking subscribe. And don't forget to follow us on Instagram, TikTok, and LinkedIn, where our handle is at Mongabay. Thank you so much for watching. See you next time.